How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the Tacoma Beast channel where as you all know, it's all about the taco. taco. We drove six hours all the way from Calico, California to meet up with the team here at Kanab, Utah. Brandon drove all the way from Dallas, Texas, 20 hours. We have Jeremy here that you guys know from the Pony Express. Chris that came from Atlanta and you guys all know Ken. Ken, what are we doing today, man? Today, we are, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take you to a couple of places. Um, we're gonna go a little north to a cave, and then we're gonna go head out and get see Lake Powell. We're gonna be playing out in South Utah, right? Yes, we are. Let's yeah. do it, you guys ready? Ready, baby. Let's do it. All right. Kanab, Utah is considered to be the central hub of America's most visited natural parks, including Zion, the Grand Canyon, and Lake Powell. The crew are starting in this old west town and will be climbing 9,000 feet in elevation to Hell's Backbone. I'm Ken Hoagland, I'm 38. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm a dad of four kids and I'm an overlander. Hey Mateo, so awesome to be back in Utah with you and going on an adventure. We're heading through Kanab and honestly, I haven't even explored much of the Southern Utah. So I'm super glad that we can be doing this together up ahead about five miles up the road are these little caves off the side of the road and dude you're gonna like flip out how awesome these are all right ken so i see the caves up there how did they what are they where are we they're called moki caves okay. and honestly i know none of the history i want to be in four loaves yeah <laughs> okay. chopper you're doing great come on buddy <laughs> <laughs> wrong shoes for this i'll tell you that that's a gnarly, you know, climb up to there. And, but just being up there and feeling how cool the air is inside the caves was amazing. Who lived here? Like someone lived in here. Like I want to live in here. Like it's 95 degrees out here and it's like 20 degrees cooler in the cave. I mean, it's just amazing to think of like who was here before. Although nearby caves were once used by the Anasazi people, these sandstone erosion caves along US Route 89, commonly believed to be an ancient dwelling, are actually man-made sand mines. The sand here is extremely fine with a high melting point, perfect for glass production. Mining activity was closed in the 1970s, giving us the awe-striking caves we see today. back in the trucks it's really hot right now we're over 100 degrees and we're on our way to see Lake Powell it's been in my bucket list for the longest time I'm so happy we're doing this hey Mateo what are you gonna air down to I'm gonna air down to 20 psi what are you airing down to yeah, I went down to 22. I got a heavier back. You don't even have like as much weight. Like, yeah, 20 will be a good, good amount of weight for you. I want it to be nice and soft. And you know, like on the comment sections lately, a lot of people have been asking us, why is it that we air down and we're just going through a gravel road? Yeah. You know, and it's a great question. So for comfort, it all comes down to comfort level. If we're going to go on a rocky terrain, do a lot of rock crawling, then you want to drop your PSI to around 13. If you have bead locks, even lower. It all depends on the terrain that you're about to hit. Because you're getting more... More traction. Your tires are going to have way more grip. But the reason why we're airing down right now is simply because of comfort. It's yeah, so comfort. nice to ride. I mean, it's not a perfect paved road. It yeah. has its bumps. You feel the, uh, the road by two different things. Suspension, and we got a great suspension. Yeah. Both of us are running the same suspension, the King 2.5 uh, reservoirs. But the other thing that controls the comfort of the road is the tires, because that's going to absorb all the hard rocks and you know, there's nothing It, it becomes crazy. extra suspension. Extra suspension, extra comfort. That's why we're doing it. Right now, we're still actually on pavement right here. I think it's one more mile and we'll be on completely dirt, but right here, it's got a bunch of potholes. Yep. That's gonna help save our wheel. Let's do it.
Utah's landscape just changes from top to bottom, left to right. I mean, it's it's so amazing just to travel across this state and see everything. My name is Brandon Haldeman, and I am 34 years old from Brownsboro, Texas. Traveled 22 hours to get here, and I just loving every minute of it, man. I have to agree with you a thousand percent how it changes from looking like literally, and I know it's probably the moon, right, into that red, like a cleachy clay color looking. It's just so freaking stellar. You're so right. I mean, it's like every corner brings a different view. All right, guys. We are just about there. And I'm excited for you guys to get your first look at this place. It's just insane. Dude, I'm excited, man. I mean, everything from the trail to that view we just had. Oh my God. That is wild. Whoa. Lake Powell is a man-made reservoir on the Colorado River, bordering Utah and Arizona. Being the second largest reservoir in the country, it has enough water to put the entire state of Indiana underwater, knee deep. President Eisenhower began construction of the Glen Canyon Dam in 1956. By 1963, the dam successfully flooded Glen Canyon, thereby creating Lake Powell. My mini me. <laughs> I heard uh, Lake Powell's drying up, and you can clearly see it here and how it's happening, and it's it's kind of sad. I mean, it's awesome that we got to see it like this, but I don't know if our future generations will be able to see this lake, right? As of October 2021, Lake Powell is only 30% full pool. Just one year ago, the water level was 50 feet higher. This marks the lowest water level for Lake Powell since it was filled in 1963. The Bureau of Reclamation recent reports suggest that the flow of water in the Colorado River could fall 20% by 2050 and 35% by the end of the century. How crazy is this view right now? Oh man. Dude, it's been amazing seeing all this and I have wanted to take you here forever. I've been wanting to come here and since I mean, forever. It's Was it worth driving 25, 20 hours? I would drive double that to get here. That's wild, man. Well, you will because you got to go home. <laughs> but before we do that, we're going to go up in the mountains because it is hot. It is extremely hot. And as when we go up in the mountains, it'll get at least 10, 15, could be 20 degrees cooler. I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm cooking. Right, Let's go. Let's, Let's go. go. Glen Canyon, although mostly submerged by Lake Powell, consists mostly of rugged high desert terrain. As Lake Powell water levels continue to drop, the once submerged Glen Canyon is beginning to emerge. Hundreds of miles of Glen Canyon have been exposed. For the first time in decades, there's an emerging backcountry with over 3,000 ancient ruins waiting to be explored. Catch this, man. I'm, I'm following Mateo. Ken's up in front of Mateo, and I cannot see. Mateo is dusting me out, and he don't have any dead gum chase lights. Mateo's in front of me, Ken's in front of him, and I can't see squat. Mateo's dusting me out. Not only that, is Ken dusting me out. Then I have David on the radio telling me to scoot up. I'm getting cracks in the windshield. Literally, I got three of them. Rocks. Dink, dink, dink. And I'm like, no, the wife's going to be pissed. Right, I haven't even told her yet. So I'm just gonna rock the cracked windshield for a while. Yeah, I've always been a firm believer that whoever's in front kicking up the dust the first and has a clear view of the trail needs to like be giving the guys behind a heads up what to expect, whether it's a vehicle or road conditions. David, however, he's like, speed up, Brandon, speed up, so I can get into that drone shot. Of course, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna speed up, dude. I'm gonna live life on the edge. And uh, so I'm, I'm racing and getting it, and then here it comes. I see the back of Ken's vehicle. I'm not supposed to see the back of Ken's vehicle, guys. Chase lights are very important for that aspect because he's two cars in front of me. So now I'm like, I've lost Mateo in the, in the cloud of dust. Here's Ken's unit, and then pff, Mateo's gas cans are like in my face. To be honest with you, it kind of pissed me off, but 
Don't tell Mateo. We are now leaving Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. Thank you for your visit. The Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument spans across nearly two million acres. While bigger than the state of Delaware, the monument spans five life zones from low-lying desert to pine tree forests. Slow down up here, guys. We've got a pretty massive uh, rut. I start going super fast to this trail and we start hitting these rocks. The, I start to get the truck drifting, it's it just having a blast. And then all of a sudden I start to hear something that's not right. Here you can see the sway bar link oh. is completely bent. Oh man. So I'm not sure if I did this out in Calico, California or here. I, I was definitely yeah. driving it a lot harder out here going fast through the trail. Uh, Calico, it was definitely way more rocky, but I was taking it nice and easy. And it's hard to say, but we gotta watch that because if we it, need to be careful, it could it could break the boot. It could break the boot, and it can also bend like the other one did last time. You know, where it completely went into the disc cover. Yeah. Um, and we don't want that because no. unbending that right now is gonna be a mission. No. no. You know, so I gotta take it easy. No uh, more uh, bombing the trails for me. No. Well, we're getting to the end of the day. We're losing uh, sun pretty quickly here, guys. Are there bears up here? Uh, I don't think there's any bears up here that okay. we need to worry about. But I'm trying to find somewhere we could camp. So we've been spending this whole day driving through the mountains. I've studied the map and I have pinpointed where I want to go, but I don't have a camp spot. I, I didn't look at the topography to figure out where it's going to be flat enough I figured at some point we're going to hit somewhere that's going to be flat enough that we could pop a tent and call it a night. But we're getting, we're just, we just keep driving. We're tons of switchbacks. This place is incredible, but the daylight is leaving and it's not cooling down. It is hot outside. Oh, yeah, dude, we can do it here. All right, it looks like we found our camp spot. This region was first conceptualized as a huge staircase ascending out of the bottom of the Grand Canyon, northward with the cliff edge of each layer forming giant steps. Due to its remote location and rugged landscape, the Grand Staircase was one of the last places in the continental United States to be mapped. We just made it to camp. We had a long day. Uh, believe it or not, driving through these trails gets you really tired. By the end of the day, you're exhausted. It's time to set up camp, eat, and then we're gonna go to sleep. One of my favorite things to do on camping is cooking. Fish isn't something easy to, to cook. It'll peel right off. It was hot last night, man, just the whole trip has been hot. Slightly miserable with how hot it is. Like I'm just always hot, but. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell us how hot you are? <laughs> it's morning of day two. Uh, the C4 fabrication team managed to find us last night. We found each other out here in the middle of the desert. We're a bunch of desert rats uh, and we love to be out here. How's it going MTV? Let me show you my house. Honestly sucks getting inside of this. I don't recommend it. We got it for a motor trip that we did. So as you can see, I do have a mattress in here. It puts me extremely high up here. Now in the morning when the sun started to come out, I really cooked myself in here. And uh, yeah, I missed my CVT tent. You definitely don't need a rooftop tent to disconnect. As you guys saw, I have a coffin and uh, it worked great. That's all you need. You don't even need a Tacoma. You don't need a Tundra. You, some of these trails that we went on, 
I mean, I don't recommend the Prius. Some of you guys in the comment section say that a Prius could make it out here. I would like to see that. Uh, but, you know, find a platform that works for you and go explore. We only slept like three hours. It was hot, muggy, but it was definitely challenging to try to get some shut eye. And uh, I'll tell you, man, having another guy up there brought a lot more body heat too, along with a little bit of that, you know what I mean? Our feet were rank. So my truck has gone through a couple changes since the last time we did a walk around. I am rocking the, the Alpha Equipped X Commander wheels. I changed out my suspension. I now have the King shocks, the 2.5 OEM shocks, and that's made a huge difference. I also changed out my upper control arm, have the control arms from uh, Camberg, and I've been impressed with those. Uh, other things on my truck that I've changed out is the tent. Now rocking the Mount Fury, trying that out, and that's a breeze to set up. One more thing that I changed is I added the decal to the side of the truck, and I have to say that probably added 10 to 15 horsepowers. David, check this out. He's got he's got a brown recluse that just like crawled up into the tent. Should I flick it? I think so, but yeah. I feel like we're all in the, flick, in the flick range right now. Look out, look out, look out. Do you want to just pull him out like this? <laughs> it's further in. Oh no. <laughs> I'm like, don't, don't eat no more spiders! <laughs> We finished picking up camp and it's time to say goodbye to the C4 guys. It's been great hanging out, but our goal today is to gain elevation, to get out of the desert and find the trees and get to much cooler temperature. How did all these roads get here? I want to say a lot of them are just like old roads that they would use for uh, like cattle and whatnot. They were just established roads that they would use for mining as well. These trails were originally established in the 1800s for exploration and research in order to chart Utah's unexplored territory. Large deposits of high quality coal have been found, but are not mineable since the area was established as a national monument in the 90s. A group of seven men from Kane County are responsible for maintaining these 735 miles of backcountry road. They use road graders that cover between one to eight miles per day. Maintenance of these roads is done solely for the purpose of allowing the public to have access to Utah's awe-striking backcountry. Thanks for this great country. You know, you have the BLM and all the resources to keep them alive. You know, driving through these trails, I always start to think about how blessed I am to be in this country. Um, you know, I come from Ecuador. It's you know considered a third world country. And, and, you know, when I came here when I was eight years old, I saw all the resources that, you know, America had to offer. And you don't have that, you know, back at home. You don't have that. And I feel like a lot of kids growing up now having all those resources, they're going to waste. They're not appreciating them. And it's kind of like a, a spoiled brat, like they, they bitch and complain when you give them too much, right? So when I was little and I was eight years old, my dad made it very clear to me that you got to work hard no matter what. And I took advantage of all the resources that this country has had and, and, and I used that to grow the company and to grow myself as a person. And, and I'm extremely thankful for, being, for living in this country. We're heading this next section into some pretty rough terrain. Uh, hole in the rock road, per the map, shows uh, it's gonna be pretty rough coming up. Hole in the rock road, a shortcut to the Escalante River, created by the Mormon trailblazers in 1879. Equipped with only pickaxes, shovels, and limited explosives, the six-week expedition turned into a six-month project as the trailblazers carved their way to the town of Bluff. We are cruising on this road going down into a valley, and I don't even know what to expect. I've seen photos, and we come around this turn, and there's this huge rock balancing. Like, it almost was, reminds me of something I'd see in Moab, but the colors are completely different. It's, it's like sandstone and this, the sheer rock walls are like dug out from like rain passing through. 
It, I'm in awe. It is a beautiful area. Holy Chicago. We've been mobbing pretty hard. Uh, we've reached the end of the trail. I'm running out of gas. It's telling me I'm low on fuel and distance to empty is 10 miles. Thankfully, this is not a trail like the Pony Express, so there are gas stations nearby. And uh, that's exactly what we're gonna go do. We're gonna go fill up, get some snacks, and then we're gonna hit the trailhead again. My miles per gallons on this trip were terrible. I think my truck did like seven miles per gallon. That was my worst gas mileage I've ever gotten. I don't know what the difference was, but in this last stretch, I got 7.8 miles per the gallon. Next up, we're just gonna go through the town about a half mile, and then we're gonna cut through a neighborhood and literally in a mile from where we're at right now, we're gonna hit dirt and we'll go up, start the trail and go get some elevation, go up to Hell's Backbone. The whole trip we've been hearing noises on my truck. Everyone hears noises. Mateo, your truck, Mateo's truck is making tons of noises, needs grease on his bushings. I'm hearing noises, but I start hearing knocking. We get out multiple times throughout the truck throughout the trip and we're shaking the drive shaft and we're noticing a little bit of movement. But we get off the trail, we finish filling up gas and this thing starts knocking. And that's something that Chris had mentioned earlier in the trip that if it starts knocking, that's when we gotta start like being a little more serious about the problems on the drive shaft. Well, we're hearing a noise. Uh, we've been hearing it for a couple days now. Uh, it's all the telltale signs of a universal joint going bad. We've got a squeak. Uh, we've got a slight vibration, um, and you really only hear it the most when you give it the gap, give it some gas, and put it in a bind, put some pressure on it. And so we're going to uh, see how loose it is. Sean, Sean's thinking we should pull it. Just go ahead and pull it instead of letting it, because you know, if it breaks, I mean, it can mess up a lot depending on how fast you're going when it happens. Yeah. It can be dangerous too, because if you're if you're flying down the road and the front breaks. The front can fall and dig into the uh, whatever road we're on and could. I mean, I've seen it happen before. It could clip a vehicle if it digs in enough. I don't know. I mean, it's moving enough that I can hear the universal joint, the stub inside the cap moving up and down and, and hitting the back on the cap. So it's definitely wearing fast compared to yesterday. Now I'm gonna just engage four-wheel drive and obviously I'll, I have no drive shaft. It won't be dr driving all four-wheel drive. It'll just be a front-wheel drive for the next section of the trip. But I'm told that the trail shouldn't be a lot of obstacles. Uh, and as long as we're not hauling butt, we should be just fine to uh, camp tonight. So as you all saw, we were able to temporarily put a solution to Ken's problem. And right now we're on our way to Hell's Backbone. We'll see it soon enough. We're, we got 21 miles to the backbone. The road to Hell's Backbone was constructed as a connection between Boulder and Escalante, climbing over 9,000 feet in elevation through Dixie Forest. The primitive road reaches into mountains that were once thought to be impassable, touching the edge of the box and Death Hollow wilderness. Right now, we're at 9,000 feet elevation and seeing this hell's backbone, just sheer drops on both sides is just mind blowing to me. Hell's Backbone Bridge, with 1,500 foot drops on both sides, spans this treacherous backbone of rock. 
that separates the head of Death Hollow drainage to the west and Sand Creek to the east. It was built in 1933 by the Civilian Conservation Corps to shorten the trip between Boulder and Escalante. Boulder was the last frontier town in Utah that still relied on mules to deliver the mail. Escalante is famous for Hole in the Rock Expedition. The original bridge was built from two flattened pine logs placed across this backbone of rock and secured in place. Remnants of the original bridge remain, but the bridge has since been reconstructed twice, once in the 60s and again in 2005. This viewpoint provides beautiful views into the gorges of the Box Death Hollow Wilderness and the Grand Staircase Escalante in the distance. We just finished crossing Hell's Backbone Bridge. We had to stop. The scenery is absolutely incredible. It's breathtaking. We stopped to take some pictures. Really enjoy the view. Uh, and it was hard for us to leave, but we have to go find our camp spot. I can't wait, I'm tired. And I cannot wait to eat some steak tonight. So the lake that Jeremy has found on his uh, maps uh, shows the lake about seven and a half miles away. I'm excited. Oh, yeah, I, I don't think I'm gonna make it across that. It's getting the tire slick and then coming around. So the reason why he can't make it is because, uh, once again, guys, he's on two-wheel drive. Front two-wheel drive. Yeah, we'll just go back down. There's that water crossing that we just passed through. It's a beautiful spot. We'll be listening to the creek run all night. That'll be great. Drinking a beer and eating steak by the creek after an awesome trail ride. Right 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 Being out here, camp next to the river, just listening to the water run by, so relaxing. Right now, the birds are out chirping. It is a beautiful camp spot. Like, I definitely want to come back here. Coming on this trip and coming on every trip is really just an escape and, uh, and an opportunity to connect with nature and just to get away, to break up the routine. You know, if I can make this my routine of going more regularly, I'll be a happy guy. Because every time I come out here, I hit that reset button, I just relax. It's nice to get out and just kind of be peaceful, listening to the stream, the birds, watching the stars. You know, and even when the, the times are bad and it's hot, it's windy, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, but I'm always coming back feeling happy. Like a new man. It's our third day out here camping. It's time for us to say goodbye. Everybody's got to head home. Brandon's got a 22 hour drive. You guys got to go to Sa uh, Salt Lake City. We got to go to San Diego. It's been a great trip. We've seen some fantastic things. Lake Powell. We've gone through some landscapes that are just ridiculously amazing. I'm going to be thinking about this trip for a long time. Hell's Backbone, oh, mind-blowing. I actually want to come back to this uh, campsite, you know. Definitely, drop it a PM. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure to do so. And we will see you in the next video.